for that. So with that, I want to introduce our panelists. I will read each of their bios so we kind of a smooth type of situation. First, uh, we have uh, Andrew Carter from the great city of San Luis Obispo. Uh, he's been a city council member since 2006. He's a member of the League of California Cities Employee Relations Policy Committee. He's a businessman and financial analyst. He's got his BA from Princeton University and an MBA from Ward School of Business. Our second panelist is Brian Mora. Brian is assistant city manager for the city of San Carlos. He manages the city's green and environmental programs and climate protection projects. He does public information, property management, and legislative programs. He's also in charge of solid waste franchise and services, intermodal projects, economic development. Uh, he, it scratched out redevelopment here, so uh, yeah. <laughs> we all know what happened with that. And um, technology activities for the city manager's department. And he serves as the acting city manager in the city manager's absence. During his tenure in San Carlos, Brandon has held the positions of interim city manager, finance director, human resources director, interim parks and recreation director, twice, and interim economic development director. His favorite was finance director, I am sure of that. <laughs> so uh, Brian is a leader in bringing technology, uh, regionalism, and government agencies together. He is a founding member and serves as co-chair of the 42 agency climate Con project projection, sorry, task force in Silicon Valley. During the city's budget balancing and shared services project, he managed the fire and emergency services portion of the project. And the nice honor in that in June of 2012, he was one of three city management professionals nationally inducted into the PTI Fellows Program by Public Technology Institute. Uh, he has also authored an article on shared services for Western City Magazine in their August 2011 issue titled, San Carlos Takes a Different Approach. And our final speaker tonight is William Rawlings. He has served as our city manager for the city of Menifee since January of 2011, where he has created a sound, financially strong new city. Previously, Mr. Rawlings served for four years as the director of redevelopment and housing for the city of Vista, where he created an aggressive, multifaceted redevelopment and economic development program. Uh, prior to that, he spent more than 20 years at the County of Orange, where his duties included responsibility and oversight for all purchasing and contracting, as well as managing its real estate operations. So did you have anything to do with the Treasury uh, with that? Uh? Well, that was, that was after that, okay. Uh, Mr. Rawlings held a Bachelor of Arts in Business Administration from California State University Fullerton and a Doctorate in Law from Western State University College of Law. So we have some very fine panelists here, and I'm, so I'm going to first introduce our first panelist who's going to speak about his topic, um, Mr. Carter. Okay, I'm Andrew Carter on the San Luis Obispo City Council. Uh, the topic is seeing sunrise from the trenches. It's interesting, I, I kept uh, giving the, the league the title of a view from the trenches and they kept changing it to seeing sunrise from the trenches. So I guess they wanted me to be optimistic, which given most people know me, I'm pretty much of a pessimist. Uh, we'll find out. Actually, I, I think we are seeing sunrise from the trenches in San Luis Obispo. And of course, we'll, we'll find out. We begin our two-year budget cycle actually November uh, with a fiscal plan for starting the next J July. So we'll begin to see if we have sunrise from the trenches uh, in a month or two. Uh, my topic is the importance of comprehensive financial analysis in managing the city budget. And I think that involves two different things. Uh, Multi-year forecasting, so looking forward, but also long-term trend analysis looking backwards. And by multi-year and long-term, I mean more than one or two years. Um, you'll see in a second that we tend to do a five-year forecast going forward, and I've actually analyzed the city's budgets going back uh, to the early 1990s. And uh, the result of this in San Luis Obispo uh, actually had some very concrete impacts on our public life and public policy in the city of San Luis Obispo. 
uh, our analysis and, and particularly my analysis, I did the looking back portion, uh, led uh, me to realize that we ne needed to undertake charter reform. We had binding arbitration in San Luis Obispo, one of the few cities in the state of California and had it, and probably one of the only cities outside of the Bay Area. Uh, and so we had to get rid of that, and we needed to initiate pension reform, which required some changes to our charter to allow us, the council, to do that. Uh, we got those measures passed in August of last year, and the impact is we've used those tools to negotiate new MOUs with all of our employees, which are going to save us about $3.1 million a year, and that's out of a budget of about $50 million. So as was indicated, I've been on the council for six years. I actually attended six years of council meetings before that, so I guess I was a glutton for punishment. Uh, actually know what that was all about. It took me three darn elections to get elected, so uh, I'm kind of stubborn. I do have my background, an MBA from the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm a business person. I've been in uh, sales, marketing, and management for over uh, 20 years, and I am a member of the Employee Relations Committee of the League of California Cities. So, enough introductions. Um, basically, as council members, we run for a lot of different reasons. There's generally some issue that interests us, and we thought of when we first run, well, something needs to be done about this. And it might be jobs, housing, growth, no growth, neighborhood quality, youth services, and the list goes on. But the key thing, no matter why we run, and quite frankly, no matter whether we're a Republican, a Democrat, or a declined to state, is that we inherit the fiduciary responsibility to manage the financial affairs of our city. And I think for a lot of us, or those who've served a long time, that probably wasn't such a big deal when the economy was rosy. But I think all of us know what a serious deal that is uh, since the, great, uh, the beginning of the Great Recession. So we, uh, when I joined the council, uh, we had a five-year forecasting process that was really developed by our long-term uh, CFO, Bill Statler, who many people know uh, in the league um, and is well-respected finance director. And it starts off our two-year budgeting cycle. And it's really an early warning system in advance of that cycle to try to tell us uh, what may be happening to us, not just in those two years, but going forward. So it's quite an extensive document. This is the title table of comments, uh, contents for the last one. It was over 35 pages. But the heart of it is actually a spreadsheet that shows what's going to happen over the next five years and obviously the assumptions that go into it. So here's that spreadsheet from the last one. And you can see it is an eye chart. And, and that actually is one of the critiques I would have about it. And you can see that a lot of detail has taken place and repeatedly taken place looking at revenue, even to the extent of forecasting items that are 100,000 to 200,000, which for our budget would be two tenths of 1% to four tenths of 1%. Uh, and so most of it, the top part is uh, revenue. And again, a critique I would have, uh, the expenses is just down here on the bottom. And that, I think, perhaps says something uh, that the focus over time was primarily on revenue and where that was going as opposed to on expenses. So my critique of, of that, and we're certainly addressing it, we have a new CFO, not that Bill Statler wouldn't be addressing it over time, he was very, very receptive to council comments, um, is the need to display uh, information more graphically. That was an eye chart. Most of us cringe when we see numbers. A uh, picture is worth a thousand words. That's true for everyone. That's true for a lot of council members who are not uh, financially aware, and it's particularly true for our citizenry. Uh, we did, as I said, an excellent job on revenues. Uh, I don't think we focused enough on the expenses. We only broke it out in three gross areas, operating programs, debt services, and CIP. There was no detail versus personnel versus non-personnel, and no de details on key personnel line items like pensions, health insurance, and the like. Uh, and although staff was obviously making assumptions on those, um, those weren't necessarily brought forward to us. Not that they were trying to hide anything, it's just the focus was always revenue. And those are certainly things that we're looking to see addressed as we start the next cycle. 
Now, what was my contribution to the, to the process? I'm a number junkie. I've been good at numbers all my life. Uh, and after, uh, so I was elected in, in 2006, and after two years um, in office, uh, you know, we had the stock market crash, and after the five-year forecast in December of 2008, there was this question that was just nagging at me, and it was, why are we always facing a budget gap? And the issue for us is, because I'd been there a long time when times were good, watching these presentations from the floor from, from the audience is that that was the case in both good times and bad. And so I set about, I had some free time, I literally spent about a month uh, looking at about 15 years worth of budget documents from the city, our comprehensive annual fiscal reports, manually entering that data into Excel spreadsheets, creating, creating charts from that, and so this is what I discovered. So you'll see this chart. Uh, the blue line is our revenue over time in millions of dollars. You'll see that green increment. In 2006, uh, we passed a half cent sales tax increment in San Luis Obispo. Uh, it passed very handily uh, because, quite frankly, people felt that the council and the, ma and the city management team were doing a good job managing the budget. And thank God we had that money because we would have been in a world of hurt uh, after, with the recession if we hadn't had it. Now what that purple line is doing, so you see this thing went back to 1993, 94, and what I did is I just inflated the uh, $21.6 million budget in 93, 94 by the CPI. And I'm a Democrat, and I hate to say this, but what this told me is that we didn't have an expense pro we didn't have a revenue problem because we had, were well above what I inflation would have done. We had had a lot of development in our community, big box stores, uh, so the sales tax was taking off, a lot of TOT growth because of the growth of wine tourism. Uh, we had a lot of property tax growth with housing prices going up. So uh, the fact that we were always facing a budget gap was not a function, in my mind, of revenue. So where was the money going? So the next thing I did is I looked at operating expenses versus CIP and debt service. And you can see that except for that 0708 year, which happened to be the first year of our Measure Y, our, our sales tax increment, uh, all the increase had gone to operating expenses. Basically, in 09010, we were at 6.8 uh, for operating expenses and, and CIP and debt service versus 51 15 years before. So it was all going to operating. Where was it going in operating? Well, then I looked at personnel costs versus non personnel costs. Not surprisingly, it was almost all going to personnel costs. And so what was going on? So here's a chart I did. Uh, the black line there is CI, CPI. And then I looked at the COLA increases that we've been giving our employees over time. And you'll see I draw a line there before binding arbitration and after binding arbitration. Binding arbitration was passed in our community as a charter measure. We're a charter city in 2000. Up until that point, basically our COLAs tracked CPI. After it was passed, it was binding arbitration for police and fire. Almost immediately, the police and fire increases began to be significantly more than CPI. Because why? Because we tried to avoid going to binding arbitration because we were worried what might happen if we went to binding arbitration. Then you'll see a big jump up in the blue line in, uh, for the 2006-10 contract. Our police went to binding arbitration we had offered them over four years 22% cost of living increases compounded. Our fire department accepted that. That ended up being significantly more than what CPI ended up doing. The police rejected it. The arbiter gave them 30% over four years. And so you can see how police and fire popped up. And then what were we dealing with? We were also dealing with a morale issue with our all other. So we started being more generous with our all other employees and that started going. So salary costs were a problem. Um, now this next chart I took, and let me explain what these charts are. I don't know, many of you are probably not familiar with an index. An index allows you to measure rate of change over time. So at the beginning, 100 is, that's just the index, it's 100. And then if you're five years out, it's 150. That means that that cost item has increased 50% over time. Now, the other thing is, uh, this is rate of change, it's not the absolute dollars, but you could see the other thing that we were facing was pension, pension costs. 
Uh, so I use this information, quite frankly, to convince my colleagues that we need to do something about it. I ran for re-election in 2010. I was one of 10 people running for a council or mayor. I was the only person talking about the need to do, to do something. But quite quickly, the rest of the council jumped on board. So we were able to place uh, charter reform measures on the ballot for August of 2001. They passed three to one. We're a democratic community, a college town, lots of public employees. We have Cal Poly, we have city, we have county, we have a men's colony, it's a prison, we have a mental hospital nearby, we even have Diablo nuclear power plants, so private sector unions. Um, and we passed it three to one that not just passing it, but the overwhelming nature of the vote allowed us to negotiate new contracts. Um, and so what have we gotten? And this is prior to the AB 340. Second tier for new employees, an end to employee, employer pickup of employee PERS, like most cities we were picking it up. Two to four years of zero COLA. Uh, that's savings, absolute savings of $3 million. And just so you know, every year of 2% foregone is $900,000 of costs you didn't incur, and that's a compounding thing. So if you avoided 2% for one year, it's 900,000 the first year, 2% the next, it's 1.8 million. So that's very quick. I'm sorry it's so quick, but that's the time I have. Thank you.